All right, good morning, everyone. So, you know, I um, realized as I was listening to uh, Mark's um, you know, opening comments and then Bill's comments that they're reminding me of how old I am. Because I, I realize it's been just about 30 years since I've been somehow involved in semiconductors. And um, John, I don't know if you saw that copper interconnect picture, but that was one of our, <laughs> one of the, uh, the IBM copper interconnect pictures that uh, we did uh, many, many years ago. And um, you know, Bill let out that I was an SRC student. So this morning, I have seen a number of folks from um, universities that we used to collaborate with when, uh, when I was still in school. So it tells you how much knowledge is actually uh, in this room. So it is um, a real honor uh, for us to be here, for me to be here, and uh, to talk about some of the collaborations, uh, some of the challenges that we face. And frankly, it is a, um, a time where there are a lot of physical limits that we're running to in uh, microelectronics, but it's also uh, a, uh, a time of tremendous opportunity, and the work that DARPA and DOD and DOE are doing are so important uh, for us in industry, as well as um, for all of us in uh, advancing what we're trying to do. So uh, the topic that I want to talk about this morning is the future of high-performance computing. And you can think of high-performance computing in many ways. You can think of it as um, the computing that we use in commercial applications, uh, whether you talk about the cloud or the large growth in data center, or you can talk about it as it relates particularly to supercomputing and really pushing the envelope of the most um, advanced uh, computing um, in the industry. And just a little bit of history about AMD. Uh, we actually turned 50 years old uh, just, uh, just in May, and I would say that you know, again, for companies to turn 50 means that um, a lot of things have happened. Uh, but the, the truth is, you know, our focus at AMD has, has always been on pushing the envelope on technology. And pushing the envelope on technology, um, I think you heard it earlier from Mark, often means that you have to make bets uh, ahead of what you know will actually happen. And certainly in um, semiconductors, those bets are made, you know, five years in advance, often 10 years in advance um, or more if you're really thinking about you know, what's the future of the next wave of computing. But whether you're talking about you know, the first gigahertz processor, the first teraflop processor, or actually much of the theme of what we're going to talk about uh, is you know, the use of advanced triplets and heterogeneous uh, technology. You know, those are things that you know, those bets have to be made many, many years in advance. Um, so a little bit about what's so exciting. Um, you know, when we have sort of this collection of smart people in a room, and you talk about what's exciting, we have just an incredibly exciting opportunity right now um, in the uh, semiconductor slash system world, because you realize that all of the workloads of the future require incredible amounts of computing power. So some people like to say that the semiconductor industry is mature, and I like to say, yes, we are mature, but we are every year becoming more and more important um, to driving all aspects of the world. Uh, again, whether you're talking about the cloud or you're talking about machine learning or you're talking about big data analytics, you know, the fact is we are generating tons and tons of data and we need some ability to analyze, use, and then make decisions on that data. And that drives tremendous computing and that's what drives you know, the, the um, need to continue to push the envelope on high performance computing. So what I'm gonna go over is perhaps um, a few trends. Uh, much of this is industry data uh, that uh, we've compiled over the last uh, couple of years, but it shows you some of the trends uh, of uh, you know, what are you know, the key um, uh, trends in uh, computing. And in this case, we're looking at both uh, CPU as well as GPU technology um, over the last 15 years or so. And you know, the net is, yes, there is, um, there is a line that you can draw through the data in terms of exponential growth and performance. Um, but frankly, you know, the line is harder and harder to maintain. So whether you're talking about high performance GPUs increasing about you know, 2x every you know, two plus years, or high-performance CPUs, this is looking at servers, 
you know, we're increasing performance, let's call it we're doubling every two and a half years or so. So we are seeing performance gains uh, when you look at it, but um, as we'll see as we go through it, it's a lot harder to get those performance gains as we go forward. Um, you know, we're going to talk quite a bit about Moore's Law. I'm sure the, the conversation about Moore's Law slowing is uh, prevalent. Um, the fact of the matter is process technology continues to be important, but process technology is not increasing um, performance um, at the rate that it used to. And so when, whether you look at density or you look at energy efficiency, we're doubling, let's call it every three, three and a half years. And as a result, there's a lot more that's needed on the system side and the architecture side to continue our performance gains on the computing side. And this is just you know, a, a rough view of how we look at this. So think of this as um, an aggregate. When you look at you know, CPUs or GPUs, you know, what are the various contributors uh, to the performance gain um, that we see at a, at a product level? Um, you can see that the process technology is still the largest piece at 40%. Uh, there are some other tricks in terms of increasing silicon power and increasing die size that give you, let's call it the next 20%. Um, but there's a vast amount of work that needs to be done in terms of system management, power management, uh, microarchitecture uh, to really keep ourselves on a, a performance curve. And, you know, frankly, this is where a lot of the work, you know, is being done um, in the, um, the fabulous community uh, today. So what are the barriers uh, to performance improvement? And again, you know, we look at how do we push the envelope, but first we need to understand what are the key barriers uh, that are there. And we start with the fact that the, um, the time in between generations is for sure increasing. And so you know, when you look at 22 to 14 nanometer, and then 14 to whether you call it 10 or 7 nanometer, you know, the time in between process technology generations is increasing. And that uh, really places a uh, significant burden on increasing performance at a given power. And you know, we'll talk about power as probably one of the, uh, the more uh, important areas of optimization uh, going forward. Um, the other piece of it is costs continue to increase. So all of the complex, you know, multiple levels of patterning, EUV, um, all of that stuff is adding to the fact that, yes, you can get to 7 nanometer, and yes, you can get to 5 nanometer, um, but each transistor is very expensive. And so you need to make sure that whatever you're using that advanced technology for um, actually benefits um, for, uh, benefits, uh, for the uh, additional cost. And again, this is cost per millimeter squared um, of, uh, of dye. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is, and you, know, you guys all know very well, is power is an incredible limiter. And when you look at designing the next generation you know, server, uh, uh, server or CPU or you know, GPU, or you look at the next generation supercomputer, you realize that power ends up being your limiting piece of it. And yes, we've been able to improve thermal design over the years. Uh, but we're not improving it that, that fast. And, and so we're limited by how much uh, thermal power we can uh, really dissipate um, in these devices. And then the other thing that's really interesting is when you look at how that power is used, uh, only about a third of the power is actually used for computation. So the actual computation is about a third of the power. And we're spending a lot of time getting data um, on and off a chip, and um, in the I.O. and um, in the caches and in the clocks. And, uh, and so that tells you a little bit of, you know, let's call it, you know, this is the world that we live in, in trying to ensure that we're continuing to uh, push the envelope on computing performance. Uh, we like that computation piece to be as large as possible, and so we like the other pieces to be as efficient um, as they can possibly be. Um, the other thing that we do is we make very, very large die. And we make very large die because we want as many transistors as possible to do as much computing as possible. Uh, but we are reaching some radical limits. When you look at 
um, our largest GPUs, they're, they're really hitting the vertical limit size, and so you can only increase uh, so much. And so you need to do other things. That's the, that's the, you know, the motivation of all these trends. Um, at some point, you need to do other things, and the question is, what are those other um, aspects? Um, we have um, a few ideas of what some of those new approaches are. Uh, these were obviously developed in conjunction with the industry over many, many years. Uh, but it's about how we put it into production and manufacturing and, and high volume. And so when you look at the various components of delivering high performance uh, from a silicon side, you know, we think about it in three key areas. Uh, the first is the foundation, uh, which is the microarchitecture. The microarchitecture has to be as good and, and gr as, as uh, efficient as it can possibly be. Um, the second piece, and Mark mentioned, you know, sort of the view into uh, 3D uh, being sort of the next wave. Um, we completely agree with that. I think that's an incredibly important initiative. And, you know, whether you start with uh, die stacking or chiplets or other avenues, um, this is really critical to solve some of, the, um, some of the issues that we talked about earlier as it relates to power dissipation and, um, and die sizes. And the third piece, which I think we're all very, very excited about, is heterogeneous platforms. Uh, this is the idea that there is no one-size-fits-all, as much as uh, we would all like to believe that uh, we could build you know, one device and it could satisfy all capabilities. That's really not true. And it's uh, less true as we go into the future. And so the concept of heterogeneous platforms that allow you to integrate the best of the best, whether it's the best from um, industry, the best from academia, um, really you know, the best from startups, uh, to, to together put together heterogeneous platforms, that requires in and of itself um, a significant amount of innovation um, as well. So um, let me go through each one of these in terms of you know, the progress and the opportunities that we have. So when you look at microarchitecture, I think microarchitecture is a, um, a pretty, uh, you know, sort of foundational one. Um, one would like to think that the rate and pace of microarchitectural innovation is, uh, let's call it, either flat or slowing down. Um, I would say that that's absolutely not the case. You know, if you look over the last, you know, number of years, the industry trend is typically to improve about, you know, let's call it mid-single-digit percentage, five, six percent per year um, over the last few years. Um, but what we've been able to show is with new architectural design techniques, we're able to bend the curve. And the idea is how do we bend the curve so that we are above the industry rate um, in terms of instructions per clock? And um, you know, this is one of the key things that we've been focused on with our new Zen architecture. And when you look at it at a product level, you, know, you can see that. So at a product level, when we look at delivered performance of, call it, let's call it the generation, first generation of Zen technology, which was in 2017, to the second generation of Zen technology that was in 2019, you know, we've in, uh, increased single-thread performance by about 30%, uh, which is significant, and that's roughly divided between IPC improvements that are 60% of that, and frankly, just very, very significant focus on circuit design and using the most advanced 7 nanometer technology for um, the rest of the 40%. So the message here is there's still plenty of room in hardware innovation. Those of you, you know, who have heard people say hardware innovation is, um, let's call it slowing down, I think you know, we believe that there's plenty of room in hardware innovation, and it just requires a significant focus on the use of each uh, transistor. Now, uh, moving on to multi-chip architectures, this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about because it's the idea of how do you use your silicon for um, the best, uh, let's call it, you know, return. Um, when you look at leading edge CPUs and also leading edge GPUs, they want as many transistors as possible. And for those of us who have been sil in silicon a long time, um, the larger the die size, the harder it is to yield, the more expensive it is, the less efficient it is. And, um, and so 
The idea of introducing triplets through a multi-trip module is not new. Uh, frankly, it's been used um, you know, many, many years ago um, in some of the, uh, you know, the largest um, computing from IBM. But uh, perhaps what is new is uh, doing it at truly high volume, where you have you know, millions and millions of devices um, that are built. And you know, this is an example of a server module with a first generation chiplet uh, technology. And each of these little die are about 200, you know, 215 millimeters squared or so. Um, if you multiply by four, it's over 800 millimeters of die area. And um, it's in 14 nanometer technology. And you're able to get silicon die area greater than the reticle limit. Um, increasing peak compute. So this is a you know, 32 core multi-chip uh, design. Um, and then the other piece of it is it's about 40% less cost than if you were to build a big monolithic uh, device. And so you have a lot of configurability and capability. Um, frankly, there are some architectural considerations that need to be put in place. So uh, you have to decide how you're going to um, route work to each of the little uh, triplets. Um, but that can be done in software, and that can be done with close partnership um, on the application level. So this was the first generation as of 2017. And if you look at the next generation um, that is to be introduced this year in uh, 2019, um, it is the, let's call it, the next revision of a high-performance triplet design. And in this case, um, in the center, uh, you have the big, um, let's call it I.O. die. So that's all of the, um, the communications uh, for it. This is actually done in older generation technology. This is actually done in 14 nanometer technology. And then you have eight little chips um, that are where all of the computing is done. So this is the idea, and those are in seven nanometer technology. So this is the idea of put your highest performance, most expensive silicon on computation because that's where you get the most bang for the buck, and then do your other activities in older generation technology. One, because frankly, they don't scale that well. Um, and uh, you know, two, because it gives you sort of the, um, the best combination of um, you know, function in technology. And what you see with this is even more capability. So we've been able to double the number of cores per multi-chip module by going from generation to generation. If you did not use this triplet technology, you would not be able to get that level of improvement in a, um, in a given generation. So um, that's sort of an idea of some of the technology. You know, how does it translate into performance? How does it translate into the things that we care about in terms of applications? Um, we believe that with the use of advanced seven nanometer technology, um, significantly improving the microarchitecture as well as using the chiplet design, we can increase server performance you know, from, let's call it, two years ago by up to 2x performance per socket and up to 4x in floating point performance. And this is the power of innovation. This is the power of bringing in some of these new technologies um, into, um, into the mix. And you know, how that looks is this is what mainstream 2P server performance has looked at like over the last five years. And our goal is to bend the curve and make sure that we're above the industry average. And that's what uh, we believe these new technologies will, um, will enable you to do. Now, um, the third area of interest is heterogeneous computing platforms. I know many in the audience are probably working on AI or AI accelerators and those kinds of things. And um, you know, the truth is, heterogeneous platforms are the wave of the future. And what we would like to believe is that we can create a platform that you can plug in the best of the best. So you're going to need CPUs. You're going to need GPUs. Uh, you're probably going to need FPGAs at some point. You're probably going to need some ASIC accelerators. And to do all of this, you need high-speed interconnect that will be able to efficiently connect all of these components. And so um, this is an area of significant innovation um, as well. And when you look at this notion of optimizing system performance with heterogeneous computing, I think we were talking about this uh, this morning at breakfast. Look, there's a place for lots of different compute, right? There's always going to be a place for general purpose CPUs, 
General purpose CPUs will do, let's call it, lots and lots of applications and pick up a lot of the legacy applications um, that are important to do. Um, GPUs have become very, very popular, especially for training in uh, machine learning. And there you get more performance, albeit over a smaller number of applications. And then the best performance is going to come from uh, custom-built silicon. And custom-built silicon, as well as um, some FPGA acceleration, that will give you the best performance, um, but presumably uh, the custom built is uh, locking in on an algorithm that will uh, be, let's call it narrow in its application space. And so depending on what we're trying to do, whether it's commercial or um, academia or government, you might choose a different uh, optimization point amongst um, each, of these, uh, each of these pieces. So with that, um, as I said, we're focused very much on the interconnect between the devices and making sure that the interconnect between these devices are as, uh, as efficient as possible. So um, let me now spend a few minutes on high-performance computing. Uh, given the audience, I think this is a, a very exciting area for us. When you look at the amount of research and the amount of work that needs to be done, um, it's incredibly exciting to think about what high-performance computing can do to accelerate that. Whether you're talking about um, climate change or um, energy solutions or you know, generic machine learning or real-time simulation, um, all of these require more compute horsepower. And we're really looking at now, let's call it out of the realm of, let's call it your typical commercial system and you're going into you know, very uh, significant simulation environments uh, that would be used for the largest computers, uh, either in the uh, private sector or in, uh, in government. And um, what's interesting about these trends, uh, and um, it is uh, really true, if you plot the world's fastest supercomputers um, off of the top 500 list, you know, for the last, let's call it 20 plus years, um, you can see the trend is actually faster than general purpose compute. Uh, we're actually doubling the performance of the fastest supercomputer in the world almost on an annual basis, every 1.2 years or so. And it tells you that when you're really optimizing for the best of the best, there are lots of things that you can do. You know, for commercial applications, you might not do that because of the cost um, elements and, you know, sort of the scale elements. Um, but this is a really exciting world because, you know, the belief is that the technology that you put into the fastest supercomputers over time will trickle down into the commercial world. And so this is actually a place where we um, innovate significantly in these, um, in these deep partnerships. So again, taking a look at this area, there are a couple of key things that you need to optimize. Um, again, you have to optimize silicon, and that's both the CPU and the GPU uh, capability. Um, you have to optimize system, uh, which is all the interconnect uh, between uh, these components. And then, uh, frankly, you would like to have the most optimized and matched software so that enough people can actually leverage the computing horsepower. You know, if it's incredibly difficult to program, you're not going to be able to use all the compute horsepower. And so you want to have um, a software ecosystem that's easy to program, um, ideally is open source, and so that people can put um, as uh, much innovation into it as possible. And uh, combined with Silicon system, you can get the, um, the best possible uh, performance. So this is kind of a pictorial view. And you know, I sort of like showing charts like this because it kind of says that each one of us has a huge piece in making these systems successful. So if you take a look at, you know, let's call it a, um, a typical high performance workload, um, what it tells you is, and in this particular case, we're looking at it with a, um, a CPU host that's hosting four uh, GPUs that are that are doing a lot of the parallel processing, you can see that there are many components to that system performance. 
Um, you start with CPU computation. Um, you can see it's probably not as big as you would think it is. You would think, you know, if you looked at systems 10 years ago, they were mostly based on CPUs. And if you look at systems today, um, they are mostly heterogeneous between CPUs and GPUs. Um, then you have the GPU compute operations, which is a, a significant piece of the computing horsepower. You have the intranode communication. So that's the communication between CPU and GPU, uh, which uh, is uh, very important and uh, takes care of how you pass data across, uh, across that. You have the memory and its bandwidth and its capacity. And then you have the network, which is the communication to the next node. And so you know, the way I look at this chart is we all have lots to do um, because we need to optimize each one of those pieces. And the closer that they are co-designed, um, the better uh, the outcome will be in terms of um, optimized performance. So one of the things that we're very proud of, um, you know, certainly uh, you know, DARPA has had a significant amount of um, impact in terms of where uh, microelectronics is going and work on the basic materials as well as um, you know, some of the integration uh, capability going forward. Um, we're also very proud of the work that uh, DOE is doing with the, um, the public sector. So, you know, DOE, and I've listed some of the other partners who are the, you know, who's who of computing, uh, including um, IBM, Cray, Intel, and NVIDIA. Um, you know, over the last seven years has really forwarded the thinking around um, how do you build great systems? And that collaboration through the Fast Forward program, Design Forward, um, Path Forward, has really helped to unlock some of these concepts of how do you put these components together uh, to build the best systems. And that includes you know, the most power efficient interconnects, it includes the memory management, it includes packaging efficiency, it includes software, simulation, modeling as well as, um, you know, again, much of this work is pre-competitive, so it includes sort of a broad ecosystem and set of standards. And so my point for bringing this up in this audience is um, it's, there's tremendous value when we put our minds towards a problem. And that's always been true, uh, you know, whether we were talking about, you know, some of the work that was done 20 years ago with, um, you know, Semitech, versus some of the work that's been done on low power electronics, some of the work that's being done on 3D integration, some of the work that's being done here um, on system level integration. There's tremendous, tremendous value in having clarity and goal, and then the industry, government, academia, putting that all together um, and, um, and really forwarding that particular goal. So, one of the things that is very, very exciting is the exascale era for the U.S. Uh, certainly this year, um, Secretary Perry has announced now two systems that are uh, meant to be exascale systems, one at Argonne and one as, at Oak Ridge uh, National Labs. Um, AMD is proud to participate in the system at Oak Ridge National Labs with uh, both our CPU and our GPU technology with the target of being the fastest supercomputer um, in the world in 2021. Now, it's a target. Um, it's a bold target to, uh, to put out there. Uh, the target would be greater than one and a half exaflops. Um, but it's one of the, those things that rallies everybody around how do you hit that target. And I can certainly say uh, within AMD, this is the, um, the most uh, exciting project that we have because it has so much technology as well as so much importance uh, from a um, you know, US uh, competitiveness uh, standpoint. And it's using all the components that I talked about, high performance CPUs, high performance GPUs, leadership interconnects, and open software tools to really unlock all of that uh, performance. So if you look at it and you go back to your line of doubling every one plus years, um, you know, Frontier would certainly keep us um, on the line. And um, as I said earlier, you know, our job is to try to bend the line and try to be um, as aggressive as possible in driving the, um, uh, the leading edge, but um, certainly it will uh, keep us busy uh, over the next um, couple of years. So um, with that, let me uh, conclude and say, 
I think there's never been a more exciting time to be in the semiconductor industry. Um, I think it's incredibly hard. Uh, there are a lot of physical barriers uh, that we're all uh, you know, facing in terms of uh, the scaling challenges, the power challenges, the system challenges, the interconnect challenges. All of those challenges are for sure there. Um, but it is also an incredible time for the most innovative, the most intuitive, and the most capable um, to really bend the line. And um, certainly, uh, that's our goal um, at AMD. That's our goal in partnership with academia and in partnership um, with DARPA, uh, DOD, and DOE. And we look at some of those components in multi-chip architectures, um, system-level interconnects, heterogeneous platforms, and of course, continued focus on the transistor itself as critical um, for us to achieve those goals. But, um, you know, again, I think there's never been a more fun time uh, to do it. And it's really great uh, to see so many friends in the audience. And I hope everyone has a, a wonderful couple of days at uh, the ERI. Thank you very much. <laughs>